Let us pray. Gracious God, you sent your son Jesus into the world to demonstrate for us what it means to live life fully under your care. Jesus has called us to love you and to love our neighbor and has modeled for us a different way of life, one of love, peace, and justice. But as human beings, we are prone to sin and are guilty of violence against one another. Forgive us for causing harm and help us to learn to forgive others as we have been forgiven. Fill us with your spirit so that we may find the grace we need to do your will. Amen. The scripture reading, and uh, either you'll have your own uh, Bible with you, or there are multiple ones in the pews. Um, the scripture reading for today is Matthew 5, Matthew 5, 43 through 48. And I'll repeat those verses uh, once everyone is at Matthew 5. Matthew 5, and the verses are, once again are 43 through 48, which I'll read out to you now while you're, while you're finding it. Uh, my advice remains the same. When we've read this through once, we'll come back to it later in the class. Uh, so don't close your Bibles, uh, even though we won't be looking at it directly uh, for a few minutes. It'll save you looking it up again. So here's what we find in Matthew 5, verses 43 through 48. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Okay, we'll come back to that. The theological focus for the day. Remember, theology is a word that we don't use in everyday speech. Um, theos, God, uh, um, logos, um, the word to speak, um, speaking about God is what theology is. Um, as one scholar said, theology is what you say right after you say, I believe, you know, um, another theologian described, defined theology as faith seeking understanding. So a lot of people say, you don't need theology, you just need Jesus. And a theologian would say, oh, who's Jesus? Jesus is the son of God, and right, you're doing theology. Yeah, so, okay. Theological focus. And this is a quote from Rawls' book, page 114. It's a short quote, there's no need whatsoever to look it up. Love of God and love of neighbor should always be our motivation as followers of Christ. And the way we share the core of our faith in the world is through multiply, multiplying fruitfulness. But sin is tempting because it's so close to being right. And I must confess that that got me thinking, that last part, because Raul says this a few times in the book. Uh, the, the problem with sin is it's sometimes so close to being the right thing. Um, and I can't wait for us to talk about that. Okay, so you have the, we've prayed, you have the scripture for the day, you have uh, the theological focus, you kind of know the general scriptural and theological and Rawls book direction that we're going in. So the conversation starter, I think, is a superb question. Rawls writes, every revolution needs at least three ingredients, a problem, a solution, and a leader. Regardless if either problem or solution is real or perceived, a revolution is meant to overthrow, overturn, destroy, or upend the way things are. Where do you see a call for revolution today? What causes revolution to turn violent? Can societal change be realized apart from violence, 
Why, why not? Those are actually five big questions. So let's just focus on the first of those. Um, where do you see a call for revolution today? Now remember, revolution doesn't have to be, you know, folks standing and singing, singing the internationale. I mean, it, it can simply be the overturning of, uh, the overthrow, the overturning, the destruction, uh, or the upending of the way things are. Where do we, where do we see, um, where do we see calls for revolution today? And we're a smaller group, slightly than normal, so we'll have to speak up even more. Or this will become the Ken Blythe monologue. Oh, I had, was that you, Jackie? It wasn't. Oh, no, I'm saying, come on, Steve. Oh, okay. Well, I'm standing up now, so someone, someone will have to take the microphone. Otherwise, I'll have to sit down with it. I don't want to do that. Alan. I mean, I think the biggest one in front of us right now, I would have said Roe v. Wade until yesterday. So now you have uh, abortion rights and you now have gun control. And there are people on both sides of these things mm -hmm. and they are very angry. Uh, and they are prone to violence, uh, as evidenced by an abortion clinic being firebombed, uh, as evidenced by some of the people almost getting in fights like the, the uh, Democratic candidate for governor in Texas oh, interrupting yes. the governor's uh, news conference when he was talking about peace and hope and a prayer for the families and love and not talking about gun control or what the real issues are. I think those are two that come to mind. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're two big ones um, that, that have, are long simmering, but, but have fresh relevance today because of the leaked memo and, uh, and, and of the, the massacre at the, at the elementary school. Yeah. It, it, it just shows you the things that you think are settled may not be settled. Um, it shows that some people prefer a settled standing decision, um, but others desire decisions to be put aside. And sometimes those, those, those two things don't follow political lines. They're, they, you know, the biggest revolutionaries can be very conservative and some revolutionaries are very conservative. And some conservative people can be very liberal. It's, it's remarkable. What, revolutions, where, where else do we see a push for, rev, for, for revolution, meaning to overthrow, to overturn, destroy, or upend the way things are? Steve, I thought you were about to say something before Alan did. Well, I was glad I waited because Alan said what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> so that was good. But I, I would add a third, and, and that is, what do we as a civilized world do with Vladimir Putin, leader of Russia? Mm. Yeah. Yes. In Davos this morning, um, or I would assume Davos last night, because this is very, no, Davos this morning, we're the other way around. Um, the Chancellor of Germany had made a statement saying, we can't accept even peace with, with Putin. Um, he is not the person with whom we can make peace um, or maintain peace. It's, it's just an impossibility given what's happened. Now, of course, the Brits will tell you that the only way to make peace is with your enemies because we've managed to annoy most of the world in our time um, and have in fact made peace with our enemies. And the, the standard joke in the world about the Brits is that uh, one day you may be a, a terrorist in the eyes of the Brits, and 15 years later, your chief terrorist is your prime minister and they're meeting with the queen. Uh, Britain has done that for the last 150 years. But Putin is a man that uh, um, we might make peace with, but cannot main, maintain peace with, I think is what the chancellor was really meaning. We may, have to, we may have to sign a peace agreement with him, but he can't stay because peace won't, won't stay. Other revolutions the overthrowing of way thing, the way things are. Susan. 
Uh, this this feeds off of um, the hor horrific events in Texas. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we need a revolution to bring God back into the family and into our our whole civilization. I do think that America is becoming godless. I think um, children are not raised properly for the most part. Um, and if they're not raised knowing God, appreciating um, how blessed they are, I think these things will continue to happen. And I know there's mental illness involved in many cases, but I do think this young man um, probably was raised in a very difficult situation and apparently no one was paying attention and it will happen again, unfortunately. Yeah, no, I hear you. It's beyond gun control, in my opinion. Um, one of the one of the cause celebrities in the ELCA some years ago was Dylan Root, who was the young man that massacred uh, the nine folks in Mother Emmanuel Church. Um, and he was a regular worshiper in the ELCA congregation. His family were all Lutheran. And he'd been baptized, confirmed, and was still at least on the edges of an ELCA congregation when he walked into Mother Emmanuel. And, and two of the people he killed were graduates of, of uh, Lutheran seminaries. Not that that should matter, to be killed is to be killed where you went to school, doesn't amount to a hill of beans, but just that Lutheran connection, um, and yet still. But yeah, isn't it a smorgasbord of mental illness, a, a, um, family conflict, um, lack of morals, um, damaged heart and soul, uh, capacity for hatred, um, access to guns, all a, a heady mix of, of stuff. I, I, I've got friends who are uh, very theologically conservative and, and see that um, you know, the sexual revolution of, of the hippie era is nothing compared to the uh, the incredible and wonderful inclusion of the LBGTQI plus um, community. And to many people, that's um, a glorious revolution to, to borrow the British phrase from William and Mary. Um, but for others, that's seen as a revolution. Uh, the the um, uh, What's the phrase that's, that was in the question? Upending the way things are. That is very much an upending of the way things are. And there are people on both sides of that, folks rejoicing and folks mourning that. But that's been an incredible upending that picked up a pace just oh, a handful of years ago, really. And I know the struggle has been long for many people, but the revolutionary aspect of it seemed to go very quickly. Other examples? Then, then the second part of this, this icebreaker is, what, what do you think causes revolution to turn violent? Because we have, we've had peaceful revolutions, you know. Um, we've had many peaceful revolu revolutions. Uh, having mentioned William and Mary, uh, the Stuart dynasty in, in Britain ended with a king simply bloodlessly being sent into exile and his daughter, Mary, and her husband, William, coming over from, from the Netherlands and becoming king and queen of Great Britain. It was an incredible revolution. Um, the, the, the peaceful revolutions in the Mideast just a handful of years ago that seemed to promise so much and really didn't come to much in the end, but it looked like for a while as if the whole of the Middle East would be turned on its head with, with a, without a shot being fired. Um, and then the revolution in Eastern Europe that led ultimately to the, the end of the Cold War, after many years of bloodshed, the final revolutions were bloodless. The Czechs came to the streets and Pavel read his poetry from the balcony and not a shot was fired. But lots of revolution is violent. What causes a revolution? Um, the overthrow, the overturning, the upending of things. Why does it tend to go violent so often? I'm thinking as far as authority, 
giving up uh, once I giving up their authority. Mm. Uh, we have a whole lot to say. Um, that's the person that came to mind was you know yeah. that 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 would cause and not one not wanting to to give up that authority to, to you know to work with the others. I think we have that we have that now. <laughs> yeah. I think. Giving, giving up power is counterintuitive to human beings. It was what made the American Revolution so revolutionary. Um, you know, the, there is a wonderful book just published, The Last King of America. A wonderful, wonderful, close examination of George III. And the point is made that George III just thought this was remarkable that George Washington served two terms and then went back to the farm and couldn't wrap his head around that. Although having said that, he'd seen many a prime minister do the same, but Europe hadn't seen a king do the same. And they were very much looking at Washington as a king. Yeah, so when you have power, releasing it can be very difficult. Look at the number of coups there's been. And the colonels of the generals say, and we will move back to democracy in 18 months. I mean, how often have we heard that? That's, you know, by the end of next year, we shall, elections will be held. And 30 years later, they're still in power. Yeah, so you're, yeah, absolutely, Jackie. Um, the, the, the reluctance to give up power once it's acquired. Other, other reasons why revolutions, in the multiplicity of meanings of revolutions, why they so often tend toward violence. Can you remember why Rawls said it? Or never mind what Rawls said, if you have another idea. He's not the be all and end all. I think we have a pretty interesting challenge um, with the whole gun debate right now, because one side has taken a line that sort of um, is directed at all of us in the faith community when it says thoughts and prayers are no longer enough. And, it, you know, I don't know how the church responds to that um, or if they respond at all, but it's an indication on one side of a impatience, a frustration, and an anger. Um, but I don't think it should go without our notice that they're saying prayers are no longer sufficient. Well, uh, that's actually a version of what uh, Pope Francis and others have said many times, but in a context far removed from gun control, that uh, prayer is good. And once you've said amen, now go out and do something about it. You know, yeah. um, I, I, I have many times told people that they're in my thoughts and prayers and in my heart, but at some point you've got to show up on the doorstep. Um, at some point you've got to show up with a, a bean casserole in your hands. Uh, you know, I, I, think, I think that's the, the Lutheran interpretation of James, the, the epistle of James. Um, not that we earn salvation by doing good, but that good works naturally flow from someone who has uh, received God's grace and entered into a saving relationship with God. Um, or to quote Luther, God doesn't need your good works, but your neighbor does. Um, so I, 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 I don't think there's anything intrinsically wrong by saying uh, thoughts and prayers don't work. They don't work if that's all there is, because then, then we're called to do something. And that do something might be as simple as a, it's not a call to heroism, it's, it's as simple as a, as a casserole, you know. It's as simple as uh, a showing up. Um, and it's as simple sometimes as a hug. Um, I think, but, but I'm, I'm with you, Steve, because I'm not sure that's what they mean. I think sometimes we're, we're, we're being told, thoughts and prayers are not enough. You have to respond in exactly the way we want you to respond in order for it to be enough. But, but intrinsically, thoughts and prayers aren't enough. Now change the world, says Pope Francis. Now, now go out and love your neighbor. Now go out and do good works. Um, I think Rawls talks about um, the turn to violence. And here, the chapter this week really resonated with me. Because you all have been here long enough to know that you know, my sermons don't repeat, but they certainly rhyme, to use a, to steal a phrase from uh, Sam Clements. Uh, 
what was his pen name? Um, Mark Twain, yeah. History doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme. My sermons don't necessarily repeat, but boy, themes come up over and over again. And one of those themes is that when we make our neighbor into other, then we rob them of their humanity and their agency and their own God-given dignity, which is in and of itself a sin. But the next step is even worse, because once we've robbed them of that, they become disposable. And disposable can mean several things. On, on one end of the spectrum, it means uh, Auschwitz and Birkenau and Belsen Belsen. On the other end, on the most innocent end, it means that we can just turn our back and not care. Because, well, what's it to me? And, and Rawls picks up on that and, and uses that phrase, create, making the other into an other, robbed of, of any dignity. And once you take that dignity away from someone, you can do whatever you want to them, or life can do whatever it wants to them. And it's no concern of ours because, uh, you know, because at that point we've, you know, we've just washed our hands. Okay, let's move on to the book. Why was Jesus crucified? Spend some time talking about that. And sometimes we don't spend time thinking about that. You know, we, we talk about how he was crucified and for what he was crucified, you know, for our sake, for our sins. Um, but we often don't pause to think, why was he crucified? Was Jesus rightly considered a dangerous person? How did his message challenge the ruling powers of his day? And how does that message challenge the ruling powers of our day? Well, I would, I would twist that a little bit. Let's start with why was Jesus crucified? And, and then we can jump into um, Le Mis and talk about, as Rawls does, some of those characters in the New Testament story, in the Passion narrative, how they relate to some of the characters in Le Mis. So let's start first with, with why. Why was Jesus crucified? Why do you think? Because most of us have at least one idea in our head of why he, why he was crucified. Maybe it's something that just came to us. We heard it in a sermon. We thought about it while we read the book, the Bible. But, um, you know, there seems to be a multiplicity of reasons. Why was he crucified? Why did he have to die? Or why did people think he had to die? And I don't mean theologically for our sins. I mean, why did they think he had to die? I think it was politically convenient for Pilate. He didn't like where he was living. He wanted to get out of there. So for him, he didn't want a revolution. Mm. It was like, I will appease you. You call it, I'll do it. Wash my hands of that. Yeah, yes, literally. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I, on a strategic level, it was because a bigger picture level. Obviously it was because, uh, that was the only way that we were going to have our sins saved. Jesus had to mm. die. As it was said so many times in the Old Testament, and I get in so many arguments with my good Jewish friends about it, about, yes, there was, but this wasn't the guy. That's how we always end up, and we go have a drink yeah. together. But, um, you know, on a, on a tactical level, it's like so many other things. Uh, you know, the Civil War had nothing to do with slavery when it started out. There were only 300,000 slave owners in the South. It was... They're telling us what to do, and we're our own states, and we need to live our own lives, and they need to stay out of it. Uh, the people that convinced Pilate were completely induced to do what they did by a leadership group of people, which happens all the time still today, who's, who you know, are saying, this is why we're doing it. You know, Putin has the orthodox leader mm -hmm. over there, who Kittle. everybody says is like, you know, the Pope for them, a godlike mm -hmm. person who's saying mm -hmm. this is a holy war against the West. And they're publishing yeah. that all over the place. Same kind of thing over and over again. So sometimes you get incited. Uh, when we talked about a little bit about violence before, why violence? Well, I think sometimes the initial violence, like in our country, the initial violence is because 
there's no downside anymore. Mm. You know, we said get rid of the police, let get these DAs, let people out of jail and everything else. I think the secondarily violence against the first violence is you just get pushed beyond, beyond belief, mm. like in World War II. They took over Poland, we didn't do anything. They mm. took over France, we didn't do anything. Yeah. They started taking over Britain. We gave, gave them lend lease uh, which warships we, and, and airplanes. Which we only paid off. I think the last British installment was during Tony Blair's right. premiership. So but I think 2008, Britain paid it, made its final payment to America of the war debt. Yeah. You know, I think right before Pearl Harbor, it was still 80 plus percent of the country oh, yeah. was pacifist and says we're not getting involved. Well, then yeah. Pearl Harbor happened. And FDR, mm -hmm. who was a fabulous leader, I, we could have long discussions about that guy, about what he did, but his leadership skills are unquestioned, mm -hmm. rallied the country to say, we need to attack the Germans. Well, it was the Japanese who bombed Pearl Harbor. You know, if you think about that, it's a masterful thing about how we got into the war as a mm -hmm. response to violence. So, yeah. Uh, but I do think that, that sometimes people get led and then they get their blood boiling and then somebody crosses a line and everybody else feels like they have to do it. Mm -hmm. I see it all the time. We watch on TV when these people are uh, looting and burning down their own neighborhoods because George Floyd got uh, murdered, which he did. Uh, they don't think about the consequences. Either. No. Their own community center. Yeah. yeah. Any, anyone else? I, th I think it... it, it... I like I like to think in symbol symbolism. Um, you know, sometimes there is a thing or a person that stands as a representation of the bigger issue. So, so you're absolutely right. There was more to the Civil War than slavery. But if you read the articles of secession because each state thought of themselves as declaring independence the way the United States did on day one. So each state put together the articles of secession saying why they were seceding. And they used as the model the, the, you know, the US Declaration of Independence and it waxed lyrical and, and said why. In each of them, it said they were doing it because of slavery. But slavery was, the, was the, the manifestation of all the other problems, which you accurately described. Um, take slavery away, it would have been something else. It just happened to be that that was the thing about which all the other hurts, slights, disagreements, and causes coalesced and said, and this is how it all comes together. We're going to defend this peculiar institution. And sometimes when you look at the story of Jesus, theologically, it has to be him. Let me say that at the outset before you run me out of town on the next stage. Theologically, it has to be Jesus. But Jesus, in another way, stands as, you know, like that thing, like that coming together of, of, of all sorts of forces and hopes, desires, fears. Take Jesus away and put Joe Schmo in you could still get a sense of why he needed to be done away with because he's threatening the religious leaders of his day and he's threatening the power of the empire. And there were other Jesuses. There were actually some others called Jesus, but then there were others called other things and they had to be done away with too because they were the ones that threatened everybody, all the vested interests. You look at Paul, Paul gets attacked because he cures a girl of her possession, of, of, of being possessed by a demon. And you would think, who could object to that? Who could find that objectionable? Her owners found it objectionable because they made money off of her telling fortunes. Wow, you know, Paul was almost killed because he cured a girl of her illness because someone lost out. And it, when someone feels they're going to lose out, 
there's a problem. So can you remember what Rawls does when he compares the cast of characters in New Testament with the characters in Les Mis? Um, the Sadducees, can you remember who he, who he says the Sadducees are the equivalent of? And I may have to look this up myself, or can I remember? No, I remember. He says the Sadducees are the equivalent of the French ruling class. Because the Sadducees are the aristocracy of Israel. They're the, they're the, they're the royal priesthood. Um, they're the ones who, from generation to generation, are the defenders of the Jewish cultic temple worship. And they have a vested interest in worship in the temple going on just as it always has. And so at the time of this revolution in Les Mis, um, it's the aristocracy of France, or the equivalent of the aristocracy, the real aristocracy having been wiped out. What, were the, what was the equivalent of the Pharisees? Yes, so who's that in Les Mis? Yes. Yeah, sorry, I didn't run over to you. Jackie says the Pharisees are the strict, strictly the law. So who in Le Mis is strictly the law? Inspector Javert. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, always remember the Pharisees. The Pharisees ultimately win. They're the, they're I mean, they're in the battle of their own in the New Testament. They haven't they haven't defeated the Sadducees, and there's all sorts of other kinds of worship going on. The Pharisees ultimately becomes rabbinical Judaism. Uh, Judaism in its, in its, in its post-New um, Testament form is Pharisaic. It becomes rabbinic Judaism. They win in Judaism. But they're pretty revolutionary compared to the, the Sadducees. long time ago or pastor the sadducees you know didn't believe in the resurrection correct that yes. is why they're sad you see uh, that's, <laughs> that's why they're that sad you see <laughs> and now, that's that always was stuck with I'm, me when i think about the sadducees i'm going to steal that <laughs> the sadducees don't believe in the resurrection that's why they're sad you see like it like it um uh, the zealots the zealots are um are a group that um they're, they're typified by Barabbas, but, you know, some of, some of the Jesus' disciples were, the New Testament tell us, tells us, were zealots. Um, what's the equivalent of the zealots in, in Les Mis? The students. The students. The friends of the Abbasa. Um, they're, they're the zealots. So who are the Essenes? The Essenes are that group from the Dead Sea of Dead Sea Scroll fame. Um, they're the ones, um, okay, uh, the Qumran community, Dead Sea Scrolls, bathed a lot for ritual purity. You walk around there, the remains of their community, it seems like a bunch of baths with a house here and there, not a bunch of houses with a bath here and there. It's, it's a bunch of baths with a few houses because uh, they were constantly washing in a very ritualistic way. Um, who's their equivalent in, in Les Mis? Valjean. Valjean who can't, never seems to be able to wash his sins away, um, but who also withdraws from the world but who also withdraws from the world. You know, Jean Valjean is always the one either hiding his identity or living in the convent as an, an assistant gardener, um, you know, or moving from house to house in Paris. Uh, he's always a little veiled and, and the, the Essenes were the same. Can you remember what Rawls said about Jesus, comparing Jesus with the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Essene and the Zealots. Um, 
Yeah, wasn't that? That's right. So, so what Jackie said there was that, that Rawls makes the point that Jesus kind of agrees to an extent with each of those groups, but, but manages not to go full tilt into it. So for the Sadducees, Jesus says, yes, you know, the um, order is good. Um, um, the tradition is sound, but don't think that's all there is. You know, there's always a but, but don't think that's all there is. Don't think that's the only way to love God. And don't think that there aren't occasions where you need to deviate from that. Um, for the Pharisees, um, they were very intent on God's word, um, on, on scripture, um, on correct interpretation. And so was Jesus. I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. I am not abolishing one jot or tittle of the, of the law. But yet, remember, the law, man wasn't made for the law. The law was made for man. Um, for the Essenes, you know, purity and time apart, yeah, but, but they withdrew permanently from the world and Jesus said couldn't do that. And the Zealots, um, now if you go into the committee room, you'll see the paintings have been moved around and we now have the cleansing of the temple in the committee room. Um, Jesus is fashioning a cord out, a whip out of cords and driving money changers out of the temple. But he also says, put your sword away. Uh, this is my hour. So back to those series of questions then. Um, the crowd chose Barabbas because they didn't have a holy imagination to believe that Christ could change reality itself. What do you think a holy imagination is? Because I thought that was a wonderful phrase. I reserve the right to use it liberally in a sermon soon. The, the, crowd, the people lack a holy imagination. What does that mean? What can't they see? Page 118 is where holy imagination gets addressed. Steve, you have any thoughts? The holy imagination, they, they, they... Well, I'm trying to come up with the words from Martin Luther, where he says, um, I cannot by my own reason and power comprehend what all this means, but the Holy Spirit has called me, enlightened me, etc. And, and I yes. think that's where this is going. That, that, I mean, the whole concept of this is almost too big and too complex for the ordinary mind to totally understand and accept. And that's why we call it faith and trust. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's true. And, and if you tie the word imagination into that, um, imagination has multiple meanings, but I always interpret it something along the lines of the ability to see things that aren't yet there. Um, the ability to see how things could be in contrast with how things are. The ability to get beyond simply past experience and constantly reapplying it, but to apply it in a creative way into the future. Um, or the ability to say, nothing from the past is gonna help me in this. This is just too different. So now I have to think of a yet more better way uh, to use the old phrase. And, and that's, that's what people are lacking when they're given that choice. Because remember, Rawls makes the point that um, when Barabbas and Jesus are standing there, the name Barabbas means son of the father. So Rawls points out there are two sons of the father standing there. And, and the crowd chooses Barabbas because the crowd always chooses Barabbas. That was a great phrase. Why did they choose Barabbas? Because they always do, you know, and they always do because they, they, they on the one hand, we lack um, uh, the holy imagination to see things the way God sees them, to see the possibilities that God sees. Yeah. 
Yes, say that again, please, because that's important. Uh, getting back to like thoughts and prayers is what would motivate us into thinking beyond and not, you know, running away from, or that, like you said, if it's not enough, well, mm -hmm. it's important, but it motivates us to think ahead and what we could possibly do. Yes, yes, absolutely. And, and that doesn't tell us what the what the right answer is that this is not some backdoor way of me saying so right after thoughts and prayers there has to be you know confiscation of weapons or gun control that might be the best course of events but what do i know i'm i'm a theologian i'm not a public policy person um but it's not enough because it lacks holy imagination um it is, it is faithful to give thoughts and prayers, but it's not imaginative. Um, it's, it's that part of our brain that says, what do I do when these things happen? I'm a person of faith, so I give thoughts and prayers. Um, but it changes nothing. It may create a change in us which is absolutely something, but we live in community with each other. So then what does a create a holy imagination lead us to do? What does our faith journey with Jesus lead us to do? What is there that we've never done before? Because while I'm on the subject of just doing it the old ways, that's what both sides are doing. I mean, the moment I heard there was a shooting, I knew there would be thoughts and prayers and gun control. There would be, you know, it's, it's all about the bad guy. It's nothing, it's not just the bad guy, it's the bad guy with guns. Um, the only thing to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. The only thing to stop people with guns is take guns away. The script was written, it all just came out. It's like winding up little toys. And then, you know, remember, boy, we're all old enough to remember wind up toys. I don't think my kids know what a wind up toy is. You know, wind up and let it go. And every time there's a school shooting, you know, the, 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 the guns have barely fallen silent and you hear the t -t 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 of everyone's little wind up toys. Um, but it lacks holy imagination. It's a great phrase. But that leads us back to a, an earlier point about um, when Barabbas is standing next to Jesus and we have two sons of the father. Um, that phrase that I said resonated with me, and I'm about to ask if it resonated with you. The problem with sin is it sometimes it's so close to being the right thing. Do you think that's true? What, what do you think that means? I mean, I, I'm obviously captured by the thought. I have to do a lot of thinking about it, but what do you think? Yeah, I, I, it's, yeah. The other one that caught my imagination was when Rawl said that the moment the crowd shouted, we, ho we have no king but Caesar, that was music to Pilate's ears. Because we, we're caught up in this narrative that Pilate is, is looking for any excuse to let Jesus go. No, he's not. If he wanted to, he could. But there's a point at which uh, Pilate realizes that he is kind of powerless because there's no way out. But when the crowd shouts, you know, shall I crucify, when, when he shouts, shall I crucify your king? And the crowd shouts, we have no king but Caesar. Oh, Pilate's as happy as a, as a you know what and you know what. <laughs> that's music to his ears. That's, that's. Fate sealed at that point. Hey, I can tell the emperor, this highly religious crowd on the holiest of times in their religion were shouting out that you were their king. Dear emperor, don't fire me. I know I'm a murderous thug that even you Romans don't like because I'm too murderous, but keep me in place. I got the crowd shouting, we have no king but Caesar. I, that hadn't resonated with me before, I've, I've got to confess. I always hear that and think, ah, see, there his hands are completely tied. Oh no, he's not washing them now, he's rubbing his hands together. So back to back to the, you know, yeah, but back back to this this concept. 
sometimes sin is just so close to doing the right thing. Do you agree with that? Does that challenge you or just make you think differently? What do you think of that concept? I think it's true. I mean, uh, I would separate it or sometimes what we do, but how we do it. Mm. And there may be many examples in our life where we meant well, but the way we did it didn't turn out so good after all. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, um, I mean, I, I, if I look at my past sins, yes, yeah, some are just egregious, but the vast majority sins nonetheless. Kind of trying to do the right thing, but didn't. So if, if, you're a, if you're a Sadducee and your whole ethos is to preserve the status quo in the temple, if you're a Pharisee trying to have your interpretation win the day and you have some control over events, it leads to a high priest saying, it's better for one person to die than for the whole nation to die. You know? That scene in the movie with Anthony Quinn set on a, 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 an island in Greece where he's given a machine gun by the Germans and told, kill these men or we wipe out your village. You know? Someone who an hour before would never, could never imagine that killing, machine gunning a dozen or two dozen men could be possibly be the right thing to do, is suddenly faced with the idea of maybe this is the right thing to do. Scary. In, in the scene, um, he decides to do it and pulls the trigger and there's no, there are no bullets in the gun. And the German says, no, no, you have to beat them to death with it, each one of them. And he can't, and they wipe out the village. Um, it's tough. So those, that crowd is looking up and seeing two people. And one of them is a local hero. You know, he's, Barabbas is a, has, has killed people, but has killed the right people, you know, for the right reason. And he's a, a hometown local hero boy. I, uh, yeah, one of them's going to live. This Jesus sounds dangerous. The other guy we know. Yeah, let him go. We know, we know his mom and dad. I'm making this stuff up, of course, you understand. But so close to being the right thing. Well, what about this guy, Pontius Pilate? He gets let off the hook. This is one of my unanswerable questions he gets let off the hook by the crowd like you said he said this is what i needed to hear you all made a decision i'm washing my hands of it and then he goes and has dinner what well, we're led to believe with his wife who's mad at him and then never really hear about the guy but yet in today's world you know all these years later millions of people say his name every sunday they're crucified under pontius pilate yeah why does he get to be in the Nicene yeah. Creed? You know, I yeah. mean, is it because he actually did the right thing, not even knowing he was doing the right thing so that we could all be saved? Or is this just too, well, am I, I just too far out I there? I like him being in the Creed because more often what we get is the whitewashing of Pilate and all of the blame being on the Jewish leaders, where it takes two to tangle. And you know, there, there is no vein of anti-Semitism that blames Pilate, not the Jews. You know, Pilate isn't accused of regicide. The Jews are. Um, there's no blood libel against Pilate. It's against the Jews. So Pilate gets off too lightly, but at least Pilate gets blamed for it in the creed. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. Now, we do know what happens to Pilate because we know more about Pilate from from the written records beyond the Bible than we do about the written records in the Bible. So we know that he was finally recalled back to Rome. Um, scholars believe he was born in Britain. Um, 
all sorts of famous Romans were in Britain at one time or another. Um, so the, the, we believe he was born in, 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 on the British Isles, um, ended up as procurator of, of the Levant, and then was too bloodthirsty for Rome and was ultimately uh, removed from his position. Um, and that is a very big, too bloodthirsty for Rome, you know? That's like saying, you know, Charlie Manson liked him, but he just thought he was too crazy. Yeah, that's really, absolutely, Alan, exactly. How bloodthirsty do you have to be when it's too bloodthirsty for the Romans? Uh, but yeah, he was ultimately fired. Um, but, but we've got in one gospel the desire to make Pilate look good because it appealed to the community in which that gospel was developed to be able to say, we're being good Romans well, as Christians. Look, we're not even blaming the procurator for, for uh, his death. His wife warned him in a vision. He did everything he could to get him off the hook, um, you know, and couldn't. So it's all the Jews. It's not, it's not the Romans at all because of a particular need for that community. I'm just hadn't thought about this before, but I'm wondering about Pontius Pilate, what, you know, what he had to live with following if he believed that Jesus was innocent, but still at the same time didn't didn't stop this. Would I, you, how would you know? What, I don't think he gave it a second thought. He didn't. Okay. I don't think so. Okay. He well, has I, he, he killed so many people okay. on one famous occasion. Um, Pilate had, a, had the crowd brought into a, a piazza and uh, sent elephants in to just trample them. You know, he's, there, there's written accounts of, of the incredible bloodlust of Pilate. I think one itinerant rabbi never thought of again. Um, there's certainly, you know, there, there's written, there are records, especially in the, 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 um, the historian Josephus, um, who writes the who writes the earliest history of, of the Jews in the Levant at the time of Jesus, and mentions Jesus by name, uh, mentions why he was crucified, mentions you know this that and the next thing. Josephus has to be you got to you got to watch your sources with Josephus. He's he um, he is part of the great Jewish revolt that leads to the destruction of Jerusalem, but he changes sides at a certain point in the Great Revolt. Um, he gets captured by the Romans and, and changes sides. So you've got to watch out. But he, he, the bit you think might be trustworthy when, when, when there's no obvious ax to grind, um, he talks about the bewilderment of the Romans, that this Jesus movement is still going, you know, um, they killed them, but but the movement is still there. It hasn't it hasn't died off the way some of the previous movements died off. Um, kill the leader, the idea dies with the leader. Kill the leader, Jesus, the idea is still. So Jesus writes about that in the decades after. What he says, Pilate. But I don't think he's a big friend of Pilate's. Um, part of uh, the bloodthirsty nature of Pilate is revealed through Josephus's history. Um, and we have several uh, translations of Josephus's, um, that's difficult to say quickly, in uh, writings in the library, because one of our scholar residences years ago um, was a translator of Josephus's work. And so we've got five or six or seven or eight copies of his translation of Josephus's history. Um, um, okay, oh, almost time then. Let's, let, uh, we got carried away, I got carried away. Um, the, the scripture, I'm not gonna start it because we have a minute to go. I feel, I, I'm filled with remorse. I was trying to do the right thing. I was trying to do the right thing, and yet still I didn't. And I've given short shrift 
to the scripture. Um, I think we've also given short shrift to Le Mis. This was a chapter I thought that Rawls really struggled to connect the dots to Le Mis. Maybe it was just my interpretation of Rawls. Maybe I've done him a disservice, but I just thought this was one of the weaker chapters um, uh, in connecting grace and faith to, to, the, to the novel. But I'm going to close with a quote um, from Rawls, um, which comes under the heading of, of life application. God calls us to stand for justice. Sometimes that may require advocacy for revolutionary change, but how we stand for justice must be done in the spirit. Must be done in the spirit, in the wisdom and the way of Jesus. It must demonstrate love for neighbor, not only for a cause, it must be seen in displays of winsomeness. There's a word you don't get to say aloud very often. It must be seen in displays of winsomeness, humility, and love. Um, one, of my, one of my heroes, uh, theological heroes, got kind of nasty towards the end of his life. Um, he did a lot of good and a lot of good writing and was probably a more faithful man than I'll ever be, so I'm not bad-mouthing him. But towards the end of his life, he became angry. And he tried to call people to a way of life, but did it with such venom and vindictiveness and anger in what he wrote that as some friends of his wrote on his death, you know, I don't think he changed any mind in the last 20 years of his life because, and they didn't say this, but I'm connecting the dots. He had no winsomeness, humility, or love in what he wrote. He was just angry that the world was the way it was and angry at people that didn't change or angry at people that didn't repent. And that doesn't win people. So that quote I ended the sermon with the other day is what I'll end with today. Um, you know, we, we, we attract people to God not by telling them how wrong they are or how messed up their theology is or how crazy their life is. Instead, we just love them with such immense love that they desire with all their hearts to learn the source of our love. And that's, uh, that's that'll do it. Uh, winsome humility and love. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for showing us another way to live, demonstrating forgiveness by forgiving us, then inviting us to forgive others in your name. Thank you for opening the way of reconciliation, not only between God and humankind, but between people who differ from one another. We pray that you would help us to receive your grace and to extend grace to others, even those with whom we disagree. May we love our enemies as Christ commands and be made perfect in your love. Amen.